March may be making history already as we're coming on the air tonight with a huge and dangerous blizzard out west. Blocking roads, look at these conditions, crashes, big concerns now about avalanches. We're live on the ground with this pretty intense split screen moment between the feet of snow and the thousands of acres of fires burning over in Texas, plus the weather system behind it all. Then President Biden late today saying the U.S. will airdrop food into Gaza, promising to pull out every stop to get help to the innocent people who need it there. More on that and the new clues he's giving about a potential ceasefire in just a minute. Plus, a critical day in two cases against former President Trump that could determine when or if he goes to trial in Florida and Georgia. We're live outside both courtrooms. Plus, in tonight's original, what's behind one state's proposal to ban legacy admissions, not just at public colleges, but private ones, too. Then the first blockbuster of 2024 is out tonight. But does Dune 2 have enough spice to break the billion dollar mark, which we haven't seen since Barbenheimer? More on that a little bit later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and right now the biggest snowstorm we've seen this season is pounding the West. It is dangerous, it is historic, maybe even life-threatening. Tough to overstate just how bad this blizzard is. Look at this, whiteouts on the road. Imagine looking through your windshield and seeing that. It's impossible, right? Officials say if you're not out by now, don't even bother to try to leave. Just stay where you are, hunker down, try to weather this storm out. You can see here some of the damage from the blizzard. That's... Well, it used to be a tractor trailer that was functional. It's all smashed up in a crash. Up higher on the mountains, the conditions are even worse with avalanche alerts at their highest possible levels. Here's a live look right now up at UC Berkeley's Sierra Snow Lab. Snow totals could get up to 12 feet. Just to give you some perspective, that is two of me, right? More than two of me stacked up. On top of all of that snow, you've got intense winds, like up to 100 miles an hour, all of it creating very dangerous conditions. It's not just out west and the snow either. It's what's happening in Texas with another disaster, these wildfires, big and deadly with thick smoke now blanketing the Texas panhandle. It's getting windier there. It is getting warmer there, and that's going to make this thing that much harder to fight. We've got reporters spread out across the country tonight. Steve Patterson in Tahoe, California, Guad Venegas in Texas, meteorologist Bill Karens tracking it all. Steve, we'll start with you. Yeah, conditions here in the Sierra Nevada is rapidly deteriorating. We've seen it hour after hour. The temperature is dropping. The flurries are picking up. The big thing is the wind is now picking up. Right now, still kind of perfect ski conditions here, if not for the fact that the gondola behind me is shut down. This is Heavenly Ski Resort, one of many ski resorts in this area, saying, you know, we know what's coming. We're going to go ahead and throw in the towel. A lot of residents doing the same. This is expected to be a momentous snow event, a winter storm that could cause severe damage, could snarl traffic, could lock people in place for days. In the mountains, you go up high enough, you're talking 15 to 16 feet of snow coming in at 100 to 110 to 120 miles per hour. Lower elevations, still bad, maybe three to four feet of snow where I'm standing, when it comes down, it could come down at 50 to 60 miles per hour. This is a blizzard warning, one of only eight issued since 2002. People in this area, of course, are hardy. They're used to it. The last one we had was almost exactly one year ago, and we know what kind of calamity that caused. Roofs were caving in because four feet of snow was on people's houses. People were trapped for days. And so residents are stocking up. They're gathering gas and chains and fuel and food and whatever they can to hunker down because over the next few days or so with maybe some of the major thoroughfares shutting down like i-80 traffic snarled you're not going to be able to move in the next few hours send it back to you our thanks to steve patterson and his crew there let's get to those wildfires in texas we now know at least two people have been killed with the biggest fire only about 15 percent contained guad venegas continues to be covering this story for us in the panhandle of texas the expectation is this weekend things could get even worse because of a shift in the weather talk us through it Hallie, you talk about this shift in the weather yesterday we were here it, it seems unreal that we were wearing jackets and hats because it was snowing and it was raining at one point we saw ice coming down and now it is hot the sun is burning on our faces as we cover this wildfire you can see a uh, part of the area in canadian this is the outskirts of canadian part of the area that burned one of the properties one of the first properties that burned when the fire made it into this area uh, behind me i've been speaking to some of the neighbors here who talk 
talked about how fast this fire spread through these areas. Now, before this was burned down, there was a lot of vegetation. So that's what we have all across the states in the areas where the fire has not burned yet. So why is it dangerous to have these temperatures increase and to have more winds coming up? Because that could ignite the fires once again. So I'm being told by officials that areas like the one behind me where we still have some parts of the field that didn't burn completely. We have some over here too. That could start again. And even some of the areas like this where we've seen it burn already, that could start lighting up again. It would require days of rain and low temperatures for all of these fields to be completely done and for these hot spots to be uh, turned off per se. Yeah. So uh, that's why they have to remain vigilant, Hallie. It's also so hard, I imagine, for the folks who are starting to come back to see whatever might be left of what used to be their homes. Correct. So as I mentioned, this is one of the structures that was destroyed by the fire. And most of the structures here in Canadian that had the fire come up to the structure were completely burned. At least at least that's what we've seen. The governor uh, was in North Texas today and he spoke about this damage. This is what Greg Abbott had to say. When you look at the damages that have occurred here, it's just gone, completely gone. Nothing left but ashes on the ground. Uh, the governor indicated that right now the assessments indicate that they could have anywhere from 400 to 500 structures that burn down. This is all across Texas. And a lot of these structures, Hallie, are in the middle of ranches, right? So you've got yeah. communities like Canadian, like Forge, and then these areas we've been to, like Fridge. Uh, but then you've got a lot of ranches with structures that also burn. So they're assessing that damage as they prepare for what is coming, the increase in temperatures and winds. And also yeah. they're waiting for that federal help. Remember President Biden said yesterday they we're going to send in air tankers, small planes, and helicopters to help out. Guad Venegas live for us there in the town of Canadian in the Texas panhandle. Guad, thank you so much. Meteorologist Bill Karens is tracking this weather system. There's a lot going on here, right? Because the weather system can help provide some relief in some instances, or it can make things worse, right? Yeah, and also anytime we get these big swings in weather, it's going to be windy too. I mean, it's windy from the plains all the way through the West Coast with this big storm that's coming in. So let's start with what's happening now in the most dangerous weather, and that's in areas of the West. We've already gotten some significant snow. If you go to Donner Peak, we're over 20 inches now. Soda Springs is 19, 17 in Palisades, Tahoe, and North Star. So we're starting to get these over a foot. We're waiting to see who will become the first to get to her two feet of snow. And as far as the storm goes, this was kind of round one today. Later on tonight and then tomorrow, Tomorrow's round two, and it's going to be colder. So the lower elevations, we're going to start getting the snow, and the snow will be lighter and fluffier at the high elevations. So it will add up more quickly, and that's when we're expecting the possibility of getting you know, one to two feet in 12 hours later on tonight during the overnight hours. That's when it'll be just absolutely treacherous to be on any of the mountain passes. A lot of them are shut down. They're not even letting you get through, even if you have chains on, anyways. So this is going to linger even into Saturday. Still, all this blue shows you heavy snow in the California and the Sierra. By the time we get to Sunday, it tapers off a little bit. I think Sunday will be the cleanup day, and then Monday will be the day, hopefully, that the roads and everyone can kind of try to get their life back to normal. We will get some rain in San Francisco all the way to Santa Barbara and Los Angeles, but not like those last big storms. It'll just kind of be a rainy Saturday for you. The snow totals in the mountains, that'll be a different story. And as far as the problems with fire weather goes, obviously we have this area with all the horrible fires north of Amarillo, but look at this huge area under red flag warnings. It's going to be a very dangerous day tomorrow from especially Colorado into Kansas and areas of New Mexico, this critical fire risk area. If any fires form, the humidity is very low. It's going to be extremely windy, and that's what we're concerned with. We'll have rapid fire growth if any fires form. So 30, 40, 60 mile per hour gusts as we go through the day tomorrow. This is the region, by the way, Hallie, where we saw Guad and where the horrible fire has been. And tomorrow, about 40 mile per hour winds. Oof, that's just going to make it so tough for those crews to get a handle on those fires. Bill Karens, thank you very much. Lots of work ahead for you this weekend, I know. To Washington now, and President Biden late today announcing the U.S. is going to airdrop food into Gaza with new fears now that that region will hit an all-out famine soon. Here's the president. But the truth is, aid flowing to Gaza is nowhere nearly enough now. It's nowhere nearly enough. Innocent lives are on the line and children's lives are on the line. And we won't stand by and let until, they, until we get more aid in there.
You heard the president talk about children's lives on the line. The backdrop to this, new reports from the U.N. of babies in Gaza dying from malnutrition and starvation. With global outrage, too, as Israel faces accusations of attacking a crowd of civilians in Gaza City with more than 100 people dead. I'm going to bring in Josh Letterman. People, by the way, Josh, who are trying to get aid, who are trying to get that food and that help that they so desperately need. Talk to us about this plan that the president is announcing just in the last couple of hours to, to literally drop help into Gaza. Why now? Well, what everyone wants to know right now, Hallie, did President Biden order these airdrops because of the catastrophe we saw yesterday with well over 100 apparently killed uh, in uh, circumstances that are disputed but have to do with delivery of aid by truck uh, through the Gaza Strip? Now, the White House today wouldn't quite say they were emphasizing the fact that this has been under discussion uh, for several weeks because they have been unable uh, to get the levels of aid to where they want them to be. Uh, but the fact of the matter is this is going to be very difficult. The White House making clear this is not going to be a one-off. They are going to do multiple airdrops over a, quite a long period of time. And the logistics are really tough for the military to carry out. First of all, you have to make sure that when you're dropping things from planes, that the aid itself doesn't fall on people and injure or kill them. You have to make sure that when the aid arrives on the ground, you don't have uh, the kinds of uh, really terrible incidents we saw yesterday where uh, people stampede over each other trying to get their hands on that aid. And of course, you also have the fact uh, that these planes are going to be flying uh, through an active war zone. So this is a very a difficult mission, but it clearly uh, makes uh, very evident the fact that the Biden administration does not feel like nearly enough amount of U.S. and other humanitarian aid is making it into the Gaza Strip. And now they're taking this extraordinary step of airdropping it in while also yeah. leaving open the possibility that they are going to bring in aid uh, through the maritime routes, essentially by ship uh, in the coming weeks and months, Hallie. And you also have now this discussion of when a ceasefire, if at all, when something like that could happen to try to get those roughly 130 hostages still believed to be held by Hamas or in Gaza out. Any update on that after the president said just days ago that he was hoping it would happen within a week? Yeah, I think it's pretty clear at this point that the president might have gotten a little ahead on his skis yeah. when he put out that potentially Monday uh, deadline, if you want to call it that, or throughout that date. Uh, in his most recent comments about this, President Biden said he's still hopeful for a deal, but probably not by Monday. And today, uh, the White House said they're still optimistic, but are certainly not putting any dates on. And that, of course, followed a lot of skepticism from Hamas, from Israel, even from the countries who are engaged in trying to broker this deal, that anything could come about that soon. And so everybody trying to maintain uh, the appearance of optimism that a deal still is possible. But I think nobody should hold their breath that we're going to see that as soon as Monday. There clearly are still very significant issues uh, that need to be worked out before we're anywhere near that deal. But of course, the Ramadan holiday about to start on March yeah. 10th. Uh, that is a big looming deadline, Hallie. Josh Letterman, thank you so much for that reporting. Lots of threads to pull on there. Also lots of threads to pull on back here at home because within the next two weeks, we are set to know whether Georgia's entire election interference case against former President Trump could fall apart. With the judge now considering whether or not to kick the Fulton County DA off that case altogether. This is all after this dramatic and honestly, sometimes a little bit salacious misconduct hearing centering around one question. Did Fannie Willis, you see her there, she's in the red in the courtroom. Did she financially benefit improperly from a relationship with the special prosecutor she hired, Nathan Wade, to work on that case? The district attorney's team, her team, her team says no. They say there's no direct evidence of that. But lawyers for Mr. Trump and his co-defendants say even despite that and even if the timeline of when she hired him is messy. It's about protecting the integrity of the court. You have to pay attention to what this looks like to the public. All you have to do is make a finding of fact that you have genuine, legitimate concerns about their credibility, about their truthfulness. These people, Your Honor, is a systematic misconduct, and they need to go. Under Georgia law, if the DA, if Fannie Willis is kicked off this case, it means it would then have to go to another county's prosecutor, and it's not really clear at all that any other prosecutor will take it up, meaning the case against the former president and his co-defendants could go poof. Marissa Parra is in Atlanta for us. So you just heard the Trump team's argument here. The district attorney's team faced some pointed questions from the judge as they focused on 
basically there's no concrete evidence. The judge was really drilling them on this. Talk us through it. Yes, so my best summary here, because uh, we've heard a lot, not just today, but yes. over the last couple of weeks here. Um, defense attorneys are making the case that they have the evidence uh, for an appearance of a conflict of interest. And we heard today among the, the many people who spoke today was a lawyer representing Michael Roman. And of course, this was um, that initial motion to disqualify Fonnie Willis and subsequently her entire team here. Um, they said today they don't need to show an actual conflict, um, that the appearance of a conflict would be sufficient. Um, so, of course, the state arguing the opposite. And before I get into that, I want to take you to what we heard a little bit from a lawyer of body earlier this afternoon. There was zero evidence, not a single shred of evidence was produced through any of the exhibits or the witness testimony showing how their constitutional rights, their due process rights were all were at all affected by the relationship that began in March of 2022. So today, a lot of the back and forth was surrounding the question on whether or not the case could be made, that disqualification could be based on the appearance of a conflict of interest. There was a lot of back and forth, Hallie, there. Um, and Judge McAfee, just to point out, has previously said that there could be disqualification on that basis. But of course, the big question is, will there be? And I also want to add a couple more things on the question of evidence. Um, there was a lot of questions, especially in the last 24 hours. We know that the defense was trying to submit all of this cell phone data, text messages. Um, we know that also the state was trying to have the court hear from someone who's an employee with Napa Valley that would corroborate what Willis and Wade have testified about paying in cash. Basically, both sides trying to submit more evidence. The judge today said, I don't want to hear more evidence. I want this to be a summary, uh, the summary arguments. I just want to hear the arguments and then I will decide if I hear more evidence. So what I thought was really telling Hallie was at the very end today, our producer Charlie Goyle pointed this out as well, when the judge was saying you'll hear from me in the next two weeks I will let you know if I need more information Hallie it's very possible that in two weeks we'll hear that the judge just wants more evidence and more information huh. so there's still a big question on whether we're actually going to have a decision in the next two weeks of course that's what everyone is hoping for and the judge has already indicated he doesn't want to keep this dragging he wants to keep this moving but so that's the thing right all of these questions come back to one central thread Marissa which is timing and timeline because that is what is so critical now yes. especially in a presidential election year obviously as we're closing in on Super Tuesday, then of course the conventions and the general election in November. So let's say, right, and I realize we're living in the land of the hypothetical, but let's just do it for a second. If the judge comes back, allows Fonnie Willis to continue on with this case, and she continues to prosecute former President Trump, when could we potentially then see him in court facing this trial? And that's a great question, though. We don't actually know the answer mm. to Holly because a trial hasn't actually been set. Um, I spoke to our producer on the ground here who is kind of filling me in on everything he's been following over the last couple of years here, um, explaining that, you know, the judge has a, a busy month at the very least. So it wouldn't be in the immediate future. Let's say we had a decision on Monday. It still wouldn't be in the next couple of weeks. He has other trials that he's taking care of. Um, but we don't actually have an exact date, Holly. We do know just from what the judge has previously said he does want to keep this moving and that timing is important and that's only in this world of hypotheticals where where we would say that you know Fadi Willis and her team is staying on this um, but just in terms of Trump the former president appearing in court worth noting and pointing out that he technically can show up whenever he wants on his own account and it was something that we thought maybe we'd see on the day that Willis ended up taking that stand and what was a very dramatic testimony so it's not out of the question of whether we'd see him but yeah in terms of any dates and formal dates of seeing him on the stand. Big question we don't have the answers to yet. Marissa Parra with the gigantic question mark, which feels like the headline tonight out of this one. Marissa, thank you so much. Appreciate it. So another one of Mr. Trump's legal, ba legal battles. And honestly, another question mark here with his lawyers down in Florida, head to head with the special counsel on when the trial in the federal classified documents case should begin. Different case. This one, remember, has to do with those documents. It's set for May 20th right now. The special counsel wants the middle of July. Mr. Trump says, nah, nah, mid-August sounds good. Smack dab in the middle of both of those dates, by the way, the Republican National Convention. We bring that up because politics are at play here. The former president's team says, really any summer trial is too close to an election and too close to his state trial on yet another issue in New York, which is set to start at the end of this month. Just to remind you about the case at hand here, the former president faces 40 federal charges for allegedly taking top secret documents that he shouldn't have back to his Florida home 
Shorthand, if a picture says a thousand words, this is it. Pictures like these, the documents laid out in the Mar-a-Lago bathroom, on a stage, etc. That's the case we're talking about. Ken Delaney and his live for us in Fort Pierce, Florida. No ruling today, but help us read the tea leaves here. Which way is this judge leaning toward figuring out when this trial should start? You know, it's hard to know her mind, Hallie, but I came away from today uh, reasonably optimistic, if that's the word, or, or confident cool. that there's more of a chance than I had thought that this case could go to trial before the November election, in part because both sides have laid out a calendar, as you said, uh, that, that has this case going to trial in over the summer. But of course, in the, in the case of the Trump lawyers, they don't really mean it because they made it very clear today. They have no desire and no intention of having this case go to trial before the election. They said that that would amount to election interference. They said that Mr. Trump belongs on the campaign trail and shouldn't be sitting in a courtroom. And it was interesting that Judge Aileen Cannon, a Trump appointee, did not push back on that whatsoever. In stark contrast to what Tanya Chutkin had to say in D.C., which is that essentially running for president doesn't exempt you from your duties as a criminal and obligations as a criminal defendant. Um, but other than that, they today both sides argued about procedural issues and scheduling issues. And one of the one of the questions is that the Trump team is trying to get discovery from the intelligence community in this case. And Jack Smith's team is fighting very hard against that, saying that they are not part of the prosecution team. You really came away from today with the with a confirmation that the Trump team is doing everything they can to slow this case down. And Jack Smith is trying to get it to trial as quickly as possible, Hallie. Ken Delaney and live for us there in Fort Pierce. Ken, it's good to see you there out in the field. Appreciate it. Overseas now, where human rights groups say tonight more than 120 people have been arrested all across Russia related to the funeral for opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Look at this. Look at some of these pictures. Thousands of people defying heavy security there to chant Navalny's name, to try to get closer to his coffin. Remember, Navalny, who's long been an outspoken Putin critic, died suddenly in an Arctic penal colony. Many Western leaders blaming Putin for his death, even as a prisoner swap to free Navalny was apparently in the works, according to what five sources tell NBC News. I want to bring in Keir Simmons, who's live for us in London. Just remarkable images coming into us now out of Russia. What else do we know about the fallout here? These arrests, which are frankly uh, potentially not surprising, considering how many people came out for this funeral. That's right, Hallie. And the Kremlin had made clear that any, as it called it, unauthorized gatherings would be illegal. Now, I mean, one of the questions for those people who've been arrested uh, is will they be released, will they be fined? By our estimation, it is possible that a case against somebody like that, and just think about all of those people standing, those thousands of people standing who line the streets today, uh, any one of them could face up to 15 years in jail. That's the bravery of those people. What's happened to those who've been arrested, it's right across Russia, as you mentioned, we don't know. I think it will take time uh, to discover that. Maybe we won't be told. That's the nature of Russia uh, these days. But yeah, the, these pictures, just extraordinary pictures, far more people than we frankly had expected yesterday that we guessed at and it just tells you something that while the kremlin believed that it was silencing navalny's message these people today have spoken with one voice it's important phrasing there here and when you look ahead to what is next who takes up navalny's fight right who becomes now the opposition leader the person who is carrying on with the work that he was doing. His wife has said she hopes to step in his footsteps. Um, she didn't yeah. come to Russia. It would, that would be a humongous risk for her as she has put herself front and center now in her, her late husband's legacy. Yeah, and, and Yulia Navalny clearly is, is somebody who may well be seen as, a, you know, as a rallying point, if you like, a, a person, a, a leader. And she actually said in her message today on social media that uh, I hope she spoke towards to her, her late husband and said, you know, I hope that you'll be proud of me looking down on, on me from there. Uh, what she can do, what anyone can do at this stage, we don't know. There is so much unknown in Russia, but what we do know today is that it really was a historical moment. Keir Simmons, live for us there overseas, watching all of it. Keir, thank you for your reporting on this issue uh, throughout the weeks and the months that have been. Thanks. Coming up here on the show, take a look at this. Pretty wild rescue in Kentucky. Oof, how first, look at that. That is a truck dangling off a bridge. We'll tell you how first responders managed to save the driver. It is an incredible story. Plus, Elon Musk now suing an AI company he helped start. 
why he claims it's not living up to its original mission. Coming up. A dramatic scene today with first responders rescuing the driver of a big rig as it was dangling off a bridge in Kentucky. Look at this, all of this going down late today. Oof. So this is it, right? You see the cab. That's the moment that the driver, look at that. They are pulling him out of the driver's side window. He is clinging to this guy, this rescuer, who's been lowered on a rope. So there you see the driver grabbing him. The rescuer grabs the driver. They are both pulled back up and pulled onto the bridge, hoisted onto the bridge to safety. And you saw it there, the cab of the truck attached to the trailer even after it went over the side. Jesse Kirsch is joining us now. It is so terrifying to look at this, to think about this, and to have a sense of the just incredible nature of the rescue to save this driver. Tell us more about it, how long it took, what we know about how the driver's doing, and how this happened in the first place. Yeah, and Hallie, I think the immediate thing that comes to mind when you see that image is, is the driver okay? And remarkably, authorities say that she does not appear to have any life-threatening injuries at this point. She was taken to the hospital as a precaution, but she was alert, according to authorities. She was talking to first responders as uh, they were beginning this rescue process. And as you mentioned, someone was able to rappel down there, get her out safely. Uh, and the truck is now being uh, removed from the area. That's an ongoing situation and so that bridge understandably remains closed unfortunately there are two other people so this was a multi-vehicle collision and authorities say there are two other people uh, who do have injuries that appear to be life-threatening so that is something we are keeping mm. an eye on and of course you hope that their conditions improve this was uh, an incident involving four vehicles according to authorities they say they get on the scene with the minutes of getting the call and then it takes about 40 minutes to get this woman who was behind the wheel uh, of this semi-truck out and back to safety. And we heard from the firefighter, uh, his name is Bryce Carden, the man yeah. who went in there, rappelled down and helped get her out. Here's part of what he shared earlier. We've definitely done a few crazy things, but yes, this, this tops it so far. Like I said, we trained for this situation probably a hundred times, but to actually put it in action, uh, it felt good. Uh, we had a successful rescue and uh, now we go back and we do it again if we have to. And he says when he got to her, she was praying, and he said he prayed with her as well, Holly. Just a remarkable situation. Wow. Again, she is now safely on land, we're told. Uh, does not have any life-threatening injuries, but again, there are those two other people yeah. uh, who do have more serious injuries, it appears, and that's something we'll be keeping an eye on. Please do. Jesse Kirsch, thank you very much for that. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, prosecutors charging a 68-year-old man with two counts of murder after he shot four people during an eviction at a home in Missouri. Police say the suspect killed the court employee who tried to serve the notice, along with the responding officer. The two other officers are expected to be okay. More charges, officials say, will be coming here. Number two, hundreds of people attending the funeral service for Lakin Riley today. The nursing student, remember, who was killed while out for a jog on the campus of the University of Georgia in her obituary. It says Riley loved nursing and caring for others. 26-year-old has been charged in her death. Number three, CVS and Walgreens will start selling the abortion pill Mifepristone this month. Both say they'll start providing the pill in a select number of states first. So not every state, but some of them. But eventually they're going to expand to other places where this is legal. It comes as the Supreme Court is set to consider a challenge to the pill later on this month. Number four, California Governor Gavin Newsom is denying that Panera Bread will be exempt from the state's new minimum wage law for fast food workers. Basically, the law does not apply to stores that make bread on site like Panera. We don't know why that is, but a report in Bloomberg suggests it could be because a Panera franchise owner has donated to Newsom's campaigns, Newsom's team, calling the story absurd. Number five, officials in Paris say they'll try to like, ease up on some of those traffic restrictions during the Olympics this summer after they met with local reps. It's meant to try to help the lives of the people who live there, try to keep them, you know, like, have it not be a pain, let's say, right, according to the city's police chief. So the whole idea is for the folks who have to live there year-round, make the Summer Olympics as easy for their lives as possible. We'll see if that's even a reality. So tonight, stocks ending the week with more record highs. The S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, again, records, their highest levels ever. Why? Well, largely because of AI stocks like NVIDIA. We've talked about NVIDIA, the chip maker there. It's all as AI is in the middle of this legal battle of the tech titans. Elon Musk 
suing now one of the biggest players in this space, OpenAI, and its CEO, Sam Altman. Musk says OpenAI has abandoned the company's founding mission of developing AI for the benefit of humanity broadly. And now he claims it just works to bring in big profits for Microsoft. Remember, Musk was one of the OpenAI founders years ago, back in 2015. No comment yet from OpenAI or its parent company, Microsoft. I want to bring in Brian Chung now. Okay, Musk, Musk stepped down from OpenAI's board back in 2018. At the time, he said AI is potentially more dangerous than nukes. Correct me if I'm wrong, isn't Musk also trying to get his own AI thing off the ground now? Yeah, and it's called XAI, and we can't forget about that. But the reason why he's suing now, by the way, because people are probably wondering, well, I mean, he left the board in 2018. Right. Why file a lawsuit in 2014? It's because of the release of ChatGPT4, which came out in about March of last year. And what he's arguing is that, okay, well, OpenAI, which he founded with Sam Altman in 2015, the whole idea was open, right? That's the namesake. And the idea was to put code out there and make sure that it's a nonprofit organizational structure where people could see exactly how this AI was being developed for the purposes of humanity. His argument is that the chat GPT-4 release last year was done secretly. This is in a lawsuit. It says, quote, GPT-4's internal design was kept and remains a complete secret except to open AI and on information and belief Microsoft. And that's really important to note here, Hallie, because the lawsuit is against OpenAI and Sam Altman, but he's really also taking blame at Microsoft. But again, that lawsuit right there, it sits on information and belief. How much Microsoft gets roped into this is going to be a very interesting thread. Um, Microsoft reportedly invested $13 billion in OpenAI, right? That's the number or the figure that's been going around here. Um, they've been working with, you know, partners in other countries, et cetera. Clearly, they are hitting the gas on AI. Talk us through some of that, because when you look at what happened, even in the markets today, AI driving those big gains for the NASDAQ, for the S&P, clearly it's here to stay. Yeah, well, and that's why it's important to remember that Elon Musk has his own venture as well with yeah. XAI. I mean, the race is on. AI is the biggest thing. I mean, we led uh, this segment with the discussion of the stock market because uh, a lot of investors have been saying, well, that's been driving a lot of the broader stock market gains is the excitement around AI. Google's in this space, although their Gemini launch was a little botched over the past few weeks. But the big story here is that Microsoft is trying to take the lead with OpenAI, which is basically on the front of this development. But here's the question. If Elon Musk can trip them up with this lawsuit, which he's mm. arguing, well, OpenAI didn't follow the rules of their incorporation by doing these types of backdoor developments. So he alleges with this with these products, well, then maybe that would allow his product XAI at some point to take the lead here. So again, we have to remember this lawsuit is not something where Elon Musk needs the money. He's very wealthy already. The question here is whether or not this changes the leaderboard in the race for developing uh, this very smart technology, which is getting smarter uh, by the minute, Hallie. Sure is. Brian Chung, thank you very much. When we come back, a lot more to get to here on the show, including Nikki Haley, one-on-one -on -one exclusively with our own Kristen Welker, ahead of her singest, big, single biggest night of the Republican primary so far. We'll tell you her new warning, plus what reportedly forced a private plane a Grammy winner was in to make an emergency landing in L.A. More on that Carol G situation coming up. Most few days to go before the biggest primary night of the election year so far, and very possibly Nikki Haley's last stand. We don't know, but maybe, right, because voters in 15 states, those 15 states in yellow are going to head to the polls on Super Tuesday. And Haley, as you know, is still in this thing. She hasn't won a single Republican primary contest so far. Hoping to change that Tuesday. She did just pick up her very first Senate endorsement from Alaska Republican Lisa Murkowski. Alaska was one of those states on the map there voting on Super Tuesday. Our Kristen Welker going one-on-one -on -one exclusively with Haley today ahead of Sunday's Meet the Press. And Haley sounding the alarm about what she thinks of a second Trump turn. Listen. Do you think Donald Trump would follow the Constitution if he were elected to a second term? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, you always want to think someone will, but I don't know. You know, when you when you go in and you talk about revenge, when you go and you talk about, you know, vindication, when you go and you talk about what does that mean? Like, I don't know what that means. And only he can answer for that. What I can answer for is I don't think there should ever be a president that's above the law. I don't think that there should ever be a president that has total immunity to do whatever they want to do. I think that we need to have someone that our kids can look up to, that they can be proud of, 
And I think we need to have a country of law and order, a country of freedom, and a country that goes back to respecting the value of a taxpayer dollar. And we don't have any of that right now. Fresh off that interview is our very own Kristen Welker, moderator of Meet the Press, who is joining us now. Okay, so here's Haley, right? Right. She is trying to make her closing argument, trying to sharpen her case against former President Trump ahead of Super Tuesday, a big deal night for her. Maybe the last time we mm -hmm. see her in this race, right? Talk us through some of your takeaways from this discussion. What you make of what she told you? Well, it, it was a stunning moment because she sort of paused and thought about it and then gave that very That's serious always warning. thinking about things is it, always, it was, you know. It was a yeah. tell that this was, this was a serious and, frankly, a candid moment. And I think, to your point, Hallie, she has been sharpening what she has been saying. She seems undeterred by the fact that she hasn't won any states. I mean, it... it seems like, and I pressed her on this repeatedly, are you just in this to make the case against Trump, to make the case for your vision of the Republican Party? She didn't deny that this was in some ways a fight for the Republican Party, but she also says she's not anti-Trump. What was notable, obviously his legal battles are looming over all of this. In the primary, you and I have discussed this just endlessly. Just talked about it on the show. Yes, like, it know, has right, only right. emboldened him but if he does win the nomination, if he is in a general election, it could be a very different story. So I asked her if she wants to see all of his cases go to trial before Election Day in November. Here's how she answered. I think all of the cases should be dealt with before November. We need to know what's going to happen before it ha before the presidency happens, because after that, should he become president, I don't think any of it's going to get heard. I don't think that a president should be immune from anything. I think that the president has to live under laws, too. And he's asking for things that no other president's ever asked for. So I hope the Supreme Court rules quickly, um, and I hope they make their decision. But I think that they do have to make an, give an answer on this. So that was notable also, basically saying these cases need to yeah. go to trial before election day. That, by the way, Hallie was at an event on the campaign trail, if you will, a little close to where close we are to right home, now. But still the trail. Falls Church. Listen, man, 30 minutes away from the bureau, yeah. that still counts. Exactly. You know, what's interesting to me, she's she's been getting sort of more and more intense about her yes. warnings about what a, yes. what a Donald Trump term would mean, a second mm -hmm. term for former President Trump in the White House. Would she still back him if he were nominated? So, okay, little tease for what you're going to see on Sunday. Oh, I girlfriend. asked her that a number of times. You'll have to tune in on Sunday to see if she gives me a definitive answer. But that's really the question, right? Is she going to back him after all of this? I can tell you, I've been talking to a number of Republicans who have said, yes, she has to because she has a political future. I ask her about how she mm. sees her political future as well. And Political future on the national stage. There's right, speculation, does right. she try again in 2028 if she doesn't get it exactly, this Exactly, right. but Hallie, the question is, I go back to your point, which is that her attacks have gotten sharper by the day how does she win back the Trump voters if she were to run in 2028? It becomes very complicated. We talk about that. We talk third about third party stuff. We right? talk about third party right. stuff. Yeah. We also talk about IVF and a little foreign policy. I mean, what a potpourri it's a, it's uh, of a fascinating potpourri. topics. We're definitely going to be tuning in Sunday morning. I will see you 100% on Sunday. You, Thank you. Sam. Appreciate Thank you. Appreciate you. For uh, me. More, of course, on Sunday on Meet the Press, and then more from Ms. Welker, myself, our friend Tom Yamas, Lester Holt, Savannah Guthrie. On Tuesday, big time Super Tuesday coverage, seven hours of it at least. Get ready, starting at 5 o'clock Eastern, however you're watching now, and on NBC News. NBC covers hundreds of other stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, the New York man convicted of killing a 20-year-old after she accidentally pulled into his driveway, getting sentenced to 25 years to life today. The judge handing down the max sentence, saying the 66-year-old didn't show any remorse. The defense says they will appeal. Out of our Western Bureau, a private plane carrying Carol G, you know Carol G, the Grammy-winning artist, reportedly making an emergency landing at an airport in L.A. KABC says the flight took off, but the pilot had to turn around after noticing smoke in the cockpit. Some dozen people were on board, but fortunately, officials say nobody was hurt. And out of our Northeast Bureau, last year's lobster catch dropped into the lowest it's been in more than a decade. The second year in a row it's gone down. Why? The industry says one reason is new rules against lobster fishing gear, which can tangle up endangered whales. They say the other reason, climate change. Coming up, the push to end legacy admissions at private schools. Why people think changes in one state could mean a nationwide movement. That's our original tonight.
To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight, it's the battle over college admissions. Because right now in Connecticut, lawmakers are looking to end legacy admissions. Like, you know, if you get into a school because a relative went there. They want to end it not just for state schools, but for private schools, too. They say it's a question of fairness. But schools like Yale, of course, in Connecticut, say it's not fair. Here's Rahima Ellis. A potential first out of Connecticut, the state trying to end one of the most controversial practices in higher education, legacy admissions. That's when a college gives preference to an alum's child, grandchild, sibling, any relative over another candidate. Colorado banned the practice for public schools back in 2021. States like California, New York, Maryland, Virginia, and Massachusetts are thinking about their own bans. Congress is too. This comes after the Supreme Court's conservative majority blocked race-based admissions in landmark rulings against Harvard and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Now Connecticut wants to take it a step further, pushing to end legacy admissions at private schools too. This is really an issue you know, of fairness, and I think it's especially important after the Supreme Court decision last year we asked Democratic State Senator Derek Slapp, who runs Connecticut's state's education committee, why he thinks schools like Yale should be subject to state law. He says it's because of taxes. Let's take Yale, where they would pay, I saw one report, $90 million more a year in property taxes if they weren't uh, granted nonprofit status. As a result, all of us pay more in taxes, right? So the schools can avoid paying taxes. And, um, you know, that's okay. That's we establish that they're nonprofits, but that means that they have to operate uh, with the public good in mind. We asked Yale if they would end legacy admissions. They did not respond to our request for comment. So far, only one Connecticut private school, Wesleyan University, has agreed to end legacy admissions. The Connecticut Conference of Independent Colleges, which represents the state's 15 private universities, told our team it opposes the concept of state legislation prohibiting independent colleges in Connecticut from giving preference to legacy students, adding banning legacy admissions will not move the needle on promoting equity. But many schools seem to disagree. According to new Department of Education data, especially out west, where some entire states don't have schools that consider legacy. And a huge shift in just four years. Just over a quarter of four-year public and private colleges nationwide consider legacy status, down from half in 2020. But more selective schools are holding tighter to the practice. 57% of them still consider legacy. Slap says that's a huge issue. So they have an enormous impact on our society these schools, and it's really a ticket to uh, the elite. And we all have, I think, a stake in making sure that you don't have to be wealthy to go to one of these schools. And that's what the data shows right now. At the most selective schools, 30% of legacy applicants come from the top 1%, two thirds from the richest 5%. Experts like James Murphy at Education Reform Now say, the backlash nationwide is now bipartisan. Republicans and Democrats both understand how basically unfair legacy preferences are. There's just one catch to this bill. If Yale or any other private school in Connecticut decides not to end legacy admissions, this bill won't penalize them. Murphy says the political pressure is enough. My expectation is that Colleges in Connecticut are law-abiding institutions. They want to be on the right side of the law. And once the law is passed, they will drop legacy preferences. Rahima is joining us now. And Rahima, it sounds like the vibe that you're getting from the folks you're talking with is that this is not a Connecticut thing, that this really is headed toward a movement more broadly across the country. Well, Hallie, some people are saying fair is fair. If the mm. Supreme Court says that there cannot be any admissions based on race, then how is it okay to base admissions on legacy, which in many cases benefits wealthy white students? So... Money is also something they think is going to be persuasive. In fact, in California this week, a couple of assemblymen are reintroducing a bill that would say to private universities that they, who are getting money from Cal State programming, that if they continue legacy funding, legacy admissions, they might lose some legacy funding, which is, I should say, not legacy funding, but it's public funding. 
Los Angeles Times newspaper did a spot that said it could be something like $26.6 million they could lose. That might be, pers be persuasive. Rahima Ellis, uh, live for us with all of that. Just an interesting story and one that's going to continue to have dominoes falling, right, in the weeks and the months to come. Rahima, thank you. March may be making history already as we're coming on the air tonight with a huge and dangerous blizzard out west. Look at this, blocking roads. We're seeing crashes. We're seeing concerns about avalanches. We're live on the ground with this intense split screen moment between the feet of snow and the thousands of acres of fires burning over in Texas, plus the weather system behind it all. Then President Biden late today saying the U.S. will airdrop food into Gaza, promising to pull out every stop to get help to the innocent people there who need it. More on that and the new clues he's giving about a potential ceasefire. Plus, a key day in two cases against Donald Trump that could determine when or if he goes to trial in Florida and Georgia. We're live outside both courtrooms. Plus, a rare show of defiance in Russia. Thousands showing up. Look at some of these images here. Thousands of people for Alexei Navalny's funeral. Turns out dozens of them got arrested. What his wife is saying tonight. And the absolutely wild scene out of Kentucky, a driver getting rescued as her truck dangled off the side of a bridge. How this even happened in the first place, we'll talk about that. Oof, look at that. That's later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie. And right now, the biggest snowstorm we've seen this season is pounding the West. It is dangerous. It is potentially historic, even maybe life-threatening. It's tough to overstate how bad it is. Because look, look at the whiteouts. Imagine looking through your windshield and seeing this. Absolutely nothing except for white. Officials say if you haven't left by now, don't even bother. Don't even bother to try to get out. Just stay where you are, hunker down, try to weather this thing out. You can see some of the damage here. That's a tractor trailer that's all smashed up, got smashed in a crash. Up higher on the mountains, the conditions are even worse with avalanche alerts now at their highest possible levels. Here's a live look right now up at UC Berkeley's Sierra Snow Lab. You can see it here. The snow's coming down. It's possible we could see totals of up to 12 feet. So imagine me and then another me stacked on top and then more on top of that. I mean, that's a ton of snow. And on top of all of it, you're going to have really intense winds, like up to 100 miles an hour. That's on top of this other potential weather disaster in Texas. You see it here. A huge, deadly wildfire. This thick smoke just blanketing parts of the Texas panhandle. It's getting windier there. It is getting warmer there. And that's going to make this thing that much harder to fight. We've got reporters spread out across the country tonight. Steve Patterson in Tahoe, California. Guad Venegas in Texas. Meteorologist Bill Karens is joining us as well. We'll start, Steve, with you. Yeah, conditions here in the Sierra Nevada is rapidly deteriorating. We've seen it hour after hour. The temperature is dropping. The flurries are picking up. The big thing is the wind is now picking up. Right now, still kind of perfect ski conditions here, if not for the fact that the gondola behind me is shut down. This is Heavenly Ski Resort, one of many ski resorts in this area, saying, you know, we know what's coming. We're going to go ahead and throw in the towel. A lot of residents doing the same. This is expected to be a momentous snow event, a winter storm that could cause severe damage, could snarl traffic, could lock people in place for days. In the mountains, you go up high enough, you're talking 15 to 16 feet of snow coming in at 100 to 110 to 120 miles per hour. Lower elevations, still bad, maybe three to four feet feet of snow where I'm standing, when it comes down, it could come down at 50 to 60 miles per hour. This is a blizzard warning, one of only eight issued since 2002. People in this area, of course, are hardy. They're used to it. The last one we had was almost exactly one year ago, and we know what kind of calamity that caused. Roofs were caving in because four feet of snow was on people's houses. People were trapped for days. And so residents are stocking up. They're gathering gas and chains and fuel and food and whatever they can to hunker down because over the next few days or so with maybe some of the major thoroughfares shutting down like I-80, traffic snarled, you're not going to be able to move in the next few hours. Send it back to you. Our thanks to Steve Patterson for that reporting. We talked about that split screen, that intense split screen. Look at this. What you're seeing on the right side of your screen, that's those wildfires in Texas that have turned deadly, killing at least two people in that state. And the biggest fire is only about 15% contained. Guad Venegas is live for us in the town of Canadian. Guad, there has been so much damage. The weather is going to get even windier now. Talk about how people are bracing for what is next, even as some are trying to start to get back to see what's left. 
Hallie, it's going to get windy and it's going to get hot. We had a high of 70 degrees today. It's about 68 degrees right now. But yesterday, I was standing down the street and it was raining. It was icy. That was an hour after it was snowing uh, down the road in another area here in the Panhandle. So you can see how the weather changes so much. And that's what experts tell me. That's what the officials here say, that the Texas Panhandle is known for those crazy weather changes. And it was the change in the winds that uh, initially made this wildfire so bad. This is the Smokehouse uh, Creek Fire, the one that is burning uh, over a million acres, the largest in Texas state history. You can see one of the properties behind me that burned down here in the outskirts of Canadian. And one of the things that also has authorities here worried is the fact that a lot of these areas that burned still have hot spots, and it would require days of rain for those hot spots to be completely put out. So with those temperatures increasing, they are vigilant because some of these spots could light up again once the temperatures rise a lot more and we get that wind back in, Hallie. What about the Smokehouse Creek Fire in Texas? It's the biggest in that state, but it is also the largest, really, of any wildfire we have on record in California, right? So you have covered, as we know, many fires over the years in California, and I wonder um, if you can reflect on some of the experiences of what you've seen there versus here. So California has a lot of wildfires, and the resources that exist there are different, right? Also in size, Texas is just much wider. The areas are spread in a different way. Uh, so uh, to start off, it's the resources that exist in California versus the resources in Texas, and also just because they don't have as many wildfires here. So the two complete different places, the geography is different. The weather changes that I've seen here in the Texas panhandle in the last three days, I have I've never seen in California hmm. covering wildfires there for years. So you've got a lot of differences in these two different places. But what you do have here that you have in other places when uh, authorities face wildfires is the vegetation, which is essentially the fuel that the wildfires require to keep expanding. We had the governor, uh, Greg Abbott, in the panhandle today speaking about the damage that we have seen. And this is what he had to say. No one can let down let down their guard. Everyone must remain very vigilant. So the governor also talked about the firefighters that were hurt. He said uh, there were three firefighters that were burned and fortunately have been released uh, from a hospital after being treated. He also mentioned that the first assessment indicates that they could have more than 400 burned structures. Now, another thing that's very difficult to deal with in Texas is the long distances between one end of the fire and another. We're in a community here in Canadian where some structures burn. We've been able to assess the damage. But in order to get to the next structure, you got to go into a ranch that's maybe 20 miles and then the next ranch is maybe 10 miles. So you've got a big area that authorities have to try to protect as they assess those damages while they prepare for this change in winds and temperatures. Hallie. Guad Venegas, live for us there in the panhandle of Texas. Guad, it is a lot uh, to navigate. It is a lot to cover. Thank you for bringing us the latest. Meteorologist Bill Cairns is joining us now. And Bill, it is the wind that is a factor in both of these uh, both of these disasters that we're seeing right now. Yeah, it's the wind that we're fearful of through tonight and tomorrow, along with the chance of this incredible snow event. So our storm has already produced about one to two feet of snow in the highest of elevations of the Sierra. So this is kind of just the appetizer. Now we're going to get more about another foot tonight, uh, tomorrow during the day, probably another foot on top of that. So, you know, Donner Peak right now is the highest at about 20 inches. When we're all said and done, someone will probably have 60 to 80 inches of snow, maybe a little higher than that. And so you just see the moisture is coming in off the Pacific and the mountains just kind of ring it out. And that's why you see all the blue right here. That's the Sierra. We're also going to get a little bit of shot of snow to the next 24 hours in the Cascades and in the mountains of Utah, the Wasatch Range. So as we go throughout the rest of today and as we go through Saturday, the storm first one goes through. That makes it colder. The snow it's going to get fluffier. It's going to get lighter. It's going to blow around more. And then as we go into Sunday, slowly things will begin to end. But in the Sierra, 5 to 10 feet, Cascades, 2 to 4 feet. In the Wasatch Range in Utah, they're about 1 to 3 feet. Yes, we're going to get some rain in San Francisco, San Jose, all the way down the coast towards Santa Barbara and L.A. But this is not like the last couple of storms where we had inches of rain. We're not concerned with mudslides or debris flows or anything like that. It'll just kind of be an annoyingly rainy Saturday in those areas. It's the mountains, obviously, that'll get the worst of it. Now for the fireworks. 
for their side of this. We already heard Guad say it was 70s today. It's going to be 70s to 80s tomorrow. We have red flag warnings from South Dakota all the way down through Lubbock, Texas, including a good chunk of Colorado and New Mexico. Tomorrow, the area of greatest concerns from Pueblo to Lamar, heading to Gaiman and all the way down to the Amarillo. And this is where we just had the horrific fires, this area where my hand is. And so we're worried about that flaring back up. And if it does, the winds are out of the south. It'll start burning into Oklahoma and possibly here into areas of the Panhandle. So this is uh, Canadian, Texas. This is where Guad was located. This is what has already burned, this uh, Smokehouse Creek fire. And with these 40-mile-per-hour winds, it's going to take the blaze northwards. And, Hallie, this is the sad part. Here's the rainfall forecast over the next seven days, for the next week, nothing. It's going to be dry as could be. So for the weekend forecast, that fire weather, weather risk, we'll have an eye on the areas that's already had the fires and any new ones that form, because if they do form, they'll spread rapidly. Bill, Karen, thank you very much with so much to cover tonight. Appreciate it. Let's bring you back here to Washington, because in just the last couple of minutes, literally in the last five minutes, we've heard from President Biden telling our team that the U.S. plans to airdrop food into Gaza, in his words, very soon. There is an urgency to this, considering the new reports from the U.N. of babies in Gaza dying from malnutrition and starvation. And on the backdrop of these new comments, now global outrage as Israel faces accusations of attacking a crowd of civilians in Gaza City, with more than 100 people killed, hoping to get aid. I want to bring in Josh Letterman. So, Josh, let me just explain what happened in the last five minutes here. President Biden is getting on to Marine One. He's heading out. That means he's going to an area of the White House campus where reporters can ask him questions. He took about 10 questions, according to the reporters there. We've got to turn this around and play it back. Our team is working to do that again. This literally just happened. But he was asked by our own Ali Rafa, our colleague who covers the White House, when these first airdrops into Gaza would be. The president said he's not positive, but he thinks very soon. This speaks to the urgency of the moment, and it speaks to how much this is front and center for the Biden administration right now. It absolutely does, Hallie. And as the president was heading uh, to Marine One, according to the reporters who were out there on the lawn, he was also asked about uh, the status of those hostage negotiations, whether he still believes there could be a deal by Ramadan, which we're just about a week and a half away yeah. from. He said he was still hopeful, but he said at this point he can't say whether there's going to be a deal uh, at all. And when it comes to uh, these airdrops that the president is now indicating are going to start very soon, he hopes, uh, you know, the, the White House is making very clear that this is an option of last resort. They did not want to be in the business of doing airdrops over the Gaza Strip because according to John Kirby, the National Security Council spokesman, the easiest way to get aid in is by truck because you can scale it up. Before the war, there were something like 500 trucks going into the Gaza Strip uh, per day. An airplane can maybe drop three, four truckloads. It can't do uh, what trucks can do. But the White House making clear that, uh, you know, even though this is something that has been under discussion for a while, that incident yesterday, as those 30 or so trucks were making their way through the Gaza Strip, now uh, well over 100 people believed to be dead, just makes clear that the trucking system is broken. It is contributing to the spiraling humanitarian crisis in the Gaza Strip, and they had to do something. In addition to these airdrops, which we expect the first one will focus really on food aid. Uh, the U.S. also says that it's now looking uh, at trying to get aid in through maritime routes, essentially mm. setting up some sea mechanism where they could bring uh, on ships or boats aid into the Gaza Strip. Well, that's a little bit farther off, but clearly uh, the U.S. Uh, understands at this point that they are on the verge of famine, as the U.N. has been saying for weeks now, and that something has to be done because the blame game continues to rage about why these trucks are not getting to the place they need to be. But the fact of the matter is uh, there are more and more Gazans who are in desperate conditions uh, every day uh, because they're not getting basic food, medicine, and clean water. Uh, and this U.S. effort now expected to start very soon to start flying aircraft over the Gaza Strip yeah. uh, and dropping aid to the people who need it. Hallie. And it's looking like he took a couple of questions. And you mentioned this, Josh, but a couple of questions on this um, idea of a potential ceasefire, especially with Ramadan, as you mentioned, set to begin soon. And the president is making clear, and I'm just looking at this, he was asked a couple of times. He says, we're, we're still working or we're not there. He doesn't know, you know, at this point, because there are so many question marks as to if there can be a temporary truce reached to be able to get those estimated 130 hostages out of Gaza. 
That's right. And what a change of tone from President Biden, who uh, just a few days ago uh, seemed like he was very optimistic. He was talking about a deal by Monday. That raised a lot of eyebrows in the region. The Israelis, Hamas, pretty much everyone else involved in this thought, we're not quite there yet. And now we see the president kind of walking back those expectations as it is very clear that there is still a wide gap uh, between Israel and Hamas that's going to need to be narrowed if they are going to reach any kind of deal that would, again, see hostages released, Palestinian prisoners released, and hopefully some type of temporary ceasefire to coincide with the Ramadan holiday, Hallie. Josh Letterman, as you know from your time uh, as well covering the White House, we can't even show you some of this video yet because it literally just happened. So there's a team of people right. working to turn that around, essentially re-rack it, play it out. We'll show you that when we can. But for now, Josh, thank you so much going through those headlines with us, fresh out of the White House from President Biden in just the last couple of minutes. Josh, thanks. Let's take it down to Georgia now, because within the next two weeks, we may know whether that state's whole election interference case against former President Trump could fall apart, with the judge now considering whether or not to kick the Fulton County District Attorney off the case altogether. It's all the culmination of a dramatic and candidly, sometimes salacious misconduct hearing centering around one question. Did Fonnie Willis, you see her there, there she is in the red in court. Did she financially benefit improperly from a relationship with the special prosecutor she hired to work on this case, Nathan Wade? Lawyers for Mr. Trump and his co-defendants say yes, and that both need to be removed to protect the integrity of the court. But the DA's team, Fonnie Willis's team says, wait a second, there is actually no evidence that she did anything wrong. There was zero evidence, not a single shred of evidence was produced through any of the exhibits or the witness testimony showing how their constitutional rights, their due process rights were all, were at all affected by the relationship that began in March of 2022. Now, under Georgia law, if the judge decides that Willis should be kicked off this case, if the DA should be kicked off, if he, that's what he decides. It would then go to another prosecutor, but it's not at all certain that any other prosecutor is actually going to take it up, meaning the case against former President Trump in Georgia, that election interference case, could dissolve. Marissa Parra is in Atlanta. We've heard the argument there from the DA's team. The defense is drilling into something that Fonnie Willis talked about a lot, that she often used cash. Explain why that matters. Hey, Hallie, well, you talked about the at times salacious nature of the last couple of weeks, and I think that one pointed example is about this very topic. Um, when we were looking at the credit card statements, I mean, that reveals a lot of really personal, sometimes intrusive details, but that has been the crux of a lot of the arguments that have been made, particularly by the defense, because I will say that um, in terms of the state, they're saying that credit card statements don't paint a full picture because District Attorney Fonnie Willis always paid for share, and she did so in cash, which obviously a credit card statement would not reflect. Um, but the defense attorney, of course, uh, claiming and refuting the opposite um, and saying that there were $9,200 that remained unaccounted for and claiming that that $9,200 was the amount of money, at, at least in part, that District Attorney Fonnie Willis enjoyed. Take a listen to some words we heard today from the attorney representing Michael Roman, who filed that initial motion to dismiss Fonnie Willis and her team. When you're a public official and you're required to keep track of gifts that you receive, uh, then you need to keep track of it. But there's no paper trail. Mr. Wade and Ms. Willis basically lived Robin Leach's lifestyle of the rich and famous. And they did this riding on the backs of the defendants in this case, funded by the taxpayers of Fulton County and the state of Georgia. So, Hallie, I will end with this. We did hear from Judge McAfee, who said quite pointedly, it's no longer a question or speculation on whether money changed hands. It did. He said the remaining question remains on whether or not the district attorney benefited from that. So we heard the arguments from both sides on whether she did or did not. And we heard the judge say today that he's going to need at least a couple of weeks to decide whether or not he needs more information or whether or not he has all the information he needs to make that decision on whether or not Willis her team will stay on this. Marissa Parra, thank you so much for that. Lots to watch in Georgia. Lots to watch also down in Florida, where another one of Mr. Trump's legal battles is playing out. With his attorneys there, head to head with the special counsel on when his trial in the federal classified documents case, different case than what we were just talking about with Marissa, but when his trial in this other case should start. So right now it's like penciled in for May 20th. It's a real light pencil because the prosecutors are saying, okay, we'll do July 8th. Mr. Trump says, no, no, mid-August sounds good. By the way, right in the middle of the July 8th and August 12th date, right in between that, that's the Republican National Convention. 
We bring it up because politics are at play here. The former president's team saying really any summer trial, they argue, is too close to the election, also too close to his state trial in New York. Again, a separate, different case than the either ones we've been talking about. That's going to start March 25th. Okay, so if you're like, Hallie, wait a second. How many cases, what are we talking, this case we're talking about in Florida has to do with the 40 federal charges Mr. Trump faces for allegedly taking top secret documents he shouldn't have had back to Mar-a-Lago, his home in Florida. Remember pictures like these? I know you remember this. The documents laid out in the bathroom of Mar-a-Lago, put on stage, etc. Ken Delanian is joining us now. No ruling today, but help us read the tea leaves here. Which way is this judge leaning toward figuring out when this trial should start? You know, it's hard to know her mind, Hallie, but I came away from today uh, reasonably optimistic, if that's the word, or, or confident that there's more of a chance than I had thought that this case could go to trial before the November election, in part because both sides have laid out a calendar, as you said, uh, that, that has this case going to trial in over the summer. But of course, in the, in the case of the Trump lawyers, they don't really mean it because they made it very clear today. They have no desire and no intention of having this case go to trial before the election. They said that that would amount to election interference. They said that Mr. Trump belongs on the campaign trail and shouldn't be sitting in a courtroom. And it was interesting that Judge Aileen Cannon, a Trump appointee, did not push back on that whatsoever. In stark contrast to what Tanya Chutkin had to say in D.C., which is that essentially running for president doesn't exempt you from your duties as a criminal and obligations as a criminal defendant. Um, but other than that, they today both sides argued about procedural issues and scheduling issues. And one of the one of the questions is that the Trump team is trying to get discovery from the intelligence community in this case. And Jack Smith's team is fighting very hard against that, saying that they are not part of the prosecution team. You really came away from today with a, with a confirmation that the Trump team is doing everything they can to slow this case down. And Jack Smith is trying to get it to trial as quickly as possible, Hallie. Ken Delaney and live for us there in Fort Pierce. Ken, it's good to see you there out in the field. Appreciate it. Human rights groups saying tonight more than 120 people have been arrested across Russia related to the funeral for opposition leader Alexei Navalny. And you got to see some of these images here. Look at these pictures. Thousands of people defying the heavy security there. And listen for a second. They're chanting his name. They're trying to get closer to Navalny's coffin to show their support. Remember, Navalny died suddenly in an Arctic penal colony, with a lot of Western leaders blaming Putin for his death. Even as a prisoner swap to free Navalny was apparently in the works, according to what five sources tell NBC News. I want to bring in Keir Simmons, who's live for us in London. The, the arrest, not super surprising here, given some of the dramatic images that we're seeing coming out of this, coming out of Navalny's funeral. Yeah, not surprising, I guess, in some ways. You could say it's surprising that there were that limited number of arrests because from those pictures, uh, you can see that there are clearly thousands on the streets in Moscow uh, lining the streets as uh, his cortege uh, came by. And you mentioned the kinds of things that they were chanting, chanting his name, chanting uh, free Russia, but also chanting Putin is a murderer and we will not forgive. So uh, the kinds of things that, as far as the Russian law enforcement are concerned are certainly illegal and yet they came out and they have made made their voices heard because of course Alexei Navalny uh, can no longer make his voice heard and it wasn't just them uh, his wife wasn't able to attend but she she put out a, a social media message in which she talked Hallie about how she hopes that he will be proud of her looking down on her and that it was so moving but also it gives you a, a sense that you know most funerals Hallie uh, are a moment of closure but not this one not not for his family not for his supporters and I, what a what a juxtaposition what a contrast this week where you had President Putin making a major speech on big uh, screens across uh, Moscow and then uh, today this answer if you like uh, from those people around the person who was his most famous opponent. Right, right. Um, there's also, and we said this in the introduction to this discussion here, and I think that people might hear it and go, wait a second, the idea that according to five sources, there were discussions about the potential for a prisoner swap to free Navalny before his death. H help people yeah. understand how does that square with the accusations that Putin is responsible for Navalny's death? In other words, if Putin was going to get something out of Navalny's release, something Putin wanted, why would then Putin have perpetrated yeah. this? 
It's confusing, isn't it? And it really, actually, what it really tells you is how murky uh, and difficult to read Russia is. I mean, you know, in the mm. days of the Soviet Union, they used to talk about Kremlinology, yeah. and I think we're back there now with, with, with trying to understand exactly what, what's going on. I will say this. Uh, there, there is a Russian... Uh, assassin in jail in Germany and uh, President Putin and those around him have made it pretty clear that that's the person they want to see uh, released, sent back to Russia and, and for that they may agree to a deal to release some of these Americans that are being held. Maybe Alexei Navalny uh, was part of that, maybe he wasn't, maybe it was initial conversations. Certainly so far those negotiations and there are clearly some kinds of talks, President Putin himself has suggested that, uh, maybe they aren't moving very quickly at this stage. Again, we don't know, but then Hallie, that's Russia now. Keir Simmons, uh, thank you so much. It is, as you say, it is murky. There are so many questions and we may never know the answers. Thanks, Keir. Coming up here on the show, dozens of people apparently dead, according to officials, after a fire at a shopping mall in Bangladesh, how it apparently started on a restaurant on the first floor, plus why one of the world's biggest cities is facing a huge water shortage. A dramatic scene today with first responders rescuing the driver of a big rig as it was dangling off a bridge in Kentucky. It is almost unbelievable to watch. So look at this. That is the cab of the big rig. It is just like hanging off the actual trailer part. This is the moment that the driver was rescued. You see the guy lowered on the rope. He pulls her out, the driver. They're being hoisted back onto the bridge. Now they're coming up. Now, the cab of the truck, obviously, still somehow attached, even after it went over the side. Jesse Kirsch is joining us now. Tell us more about it, how long it took, what we know about how the driver's doing, and how this happened in the first place. Yeah, and Hallie, I think the immediate thing that comes to mind when you see that image is, is the driver okay? And remarkably, authorities say that she does not appear to have any life-threatening injuries at this point. She was taken to the hospital as a precaution, but she was alert, according to authorities. She was talking to first responders as uh, they were beginning this rescue process. And as you mentioned, someone was able to rappel down there, get her out safely. Uh, and the truck is now being uh, removed from the area. That's an ongoing situation situation and so that bridge understandably remains closed. Unfortunately, there are two other people. So this is a multi-vehicle collision and authorities say there are two other people uh, who do have injuries that appear to be life-threatening. So that is something we are keeping mm. an eye on. And of course, you hope that their conditions improve. This was uh, an incident involving four vehicles. According to authorities, they say they get on the scene with the minutes of getting the call. And then it takes about 40 minutes to get this woman who was behind the wheel uh, of this semi-truck out and back to safety. And we heard from the firefighter, uh, his name is Bryce Carden, the man yeah. who went in there, rappelled down and helped get her out. Here's part of what he shared earlier. We've definitely done a few crazy things, but yes, this, this tops it so far. Like I said, we trained for this situation probably a hundred times, but to actually put it in action, uh, it felt good. Uh, we had successful rescue and uh, now we go back and we do it again if we have to. And he says when he got to her, she was praying, and he said he prayed with her as well, Holly. Just a remarkable situation. Wow. Again, she is now safely on land, we're told. Uh, does not have any life-threatening injuries, but again, there are those two other people yeah. uh, who do have more serious injuries, it appears, and that's something we'll be keeping an eye on. Please do. Jesse Kirsch, thank you very much for that. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, a judge sentencing a Colorado paramedic to five years in prison in the 2019 death of Elijah McClain. This medic, one of two, convicted of criminally negligent homicide in December. Remember, McLean was a young black man who died from cardiac arrest after police put him in a chokehold, and medics injected him with a lethal dose of ketamine. It's really rare for medical res first responders to get prosecuted in these types of cases, so a lot of folks have been watching this one. Number two, Michelle Traconis found guilty today in the death of her boyfriend's estranged wife, who disappeared nearly five years ago. Her boyfriend, Fotis Dulos, had also been charged in this case before his death in 2020. A judge declared Jennifer Dulos dead last year. Her body has never been found. Traconis is set to be sentenced in May. Her sister saying she's innocent of all the charges. Number three, some new guidance out from the CBC, CDC saying that if you test positive for COVID, you don't have to isolate for five days. That matches public health advice for the flu and for other respiratory illnesses. You stay home when you're sick. You go back when you're feeling better and if you've been without a fever for 24 hours. 
This is as hospitalization rates and deaths have stayed at lower levels this past season. Number four, California Governor Gavin Newsom is denying that Panera Bread will be exempt from the state's new minimum wage law for fast food workers. Here's the deal. The law basically doesn't apply to stores that make bread on site, like Panera. We don't know why that is, but a Bloomberg report suggests it could be because a Panera franchise owner has donated to Newsom's campaigns. Newsom's team says the story is absurd. Number five, officials in Paris say they're going to try to ease up on some traffic restrictions during this summer's Olympics. It's meant to make people who live in the city have like a, as, as much of a routine as possible, as few disruptions as possible ahead of these summer games. Tonight, stocks ending the week with more record highs. The S&P, the NASDAQ. I mean, listen, their highest levels ever. Why? Well, it's being driven by this AI tech boom, partly because of stocks like uh, NVIDIA. Remember the chip maker we told you about last week? It comes as AI is in the middle of a legal battle of the tech titans with Elon Musk suing one of the biggest players in the space, OpenAI, and its CEO, Sam Altman. Musk claims that OpenAI has abandoned their founding mission of developing this technology for the benefit of humanity broadly saying now it just works to bring in big profits for Microsoft. There's some history here. Musk was a co-founder of OpenAI back in 2015. No comment yet from that company or from Microsoft. Brian Chung is joining us now. Musk stepped down from OpenAI's board back in 2018. At the time, he said this AI is potentially more dangerous than nukes. F correct me if I'm wrong, isn't Musk also trying to get his own AI thing off the ground now? Yeah, and it's called XAI, and we can't forget about that. But the reason why he's suing now, by the way, because people are probably wondering, well, I mean, he left the board in 2018. Right. Why file a lawsuit in 2014? It's because of the release of ChatGPT4, which came out in about March of last year. And what he's arguing is that, okay, well, OpenAI, which he founded with Sam Altman in 2015, the whole idea was open, right? That's the namesake. And the idea was to put code out there and make sure that it's a nonprofit organizational structure where people could see exactly how this AI was being developed for the purposes of humanity. His argument is that the chat GPT-4 release last year was done secretly. This is in a lawsuit. It says, quote, GPT-4's internal design was kept and remains a complete secret except to open AI and on information and belief Microsoft. And that's really important to note here, Hallie, because the lawsuit is against OpenAI and Sam Altman, but he's really also taking blame at Microsoft. But again, that lawsuit right there, it sits on information and belief. How much Microsoft gets roped into this is going to be a very interesting thread. Um, Microsoft reportedly invested $13 billion in OpenAI, right? That's the number or the figure that's been going around here. Um, they've been working with you know, partners in other countries, et cetera. Clearly, they are hitting the gas on AI. Talk us through some of that, because when you look at what happened, even in the markets today, AI driving those big gains for the NASDAQ, for the S&P, clearly it's here to stay. Yeah, well, and that's why it's important to remember that Elon Musk has his own venture as well with XAI. Yeah. I mean, the race is on. AI is the biggest thing. I mean, we led uh, this segment with the discussion of the stock market because uh, a lot of investors have been saying, well, that's been driving a lot of the broader stock market gains is the excitement around AI. Google's in this space, although their Gemini launch was a little botched over the past few weeks. But the big story here is that Microsoft is trying to take the lead with OpenAI, which is basically on the front of this development. But here's the question. If Elon Musk can trip them up with this, lawsuit, which he's mm. arguing, well, OpenAI didn't follow the rules of their incorporation by doing these types of backdoor developments. So he alleges with this with these products, well, then maybe that would allow his product XAI at some point to take the lead here. So again, we have to remember this lawsuit is not something where Elon Musk needs the money. He's very wealthy already. The question here is whether or not this changes the leaderboard in the race for developing uh, this very smart technology, which is getting smarter uh, by the minute, Hallie. Sure is. Brian Chung, thank you very much. When we come back, our own Kristen Welker going one-on-one -on -one with Nikki Haley for an exclusive interview. What she is warning about a possible second Trump term. Plus, pretty scary scene in Peru. What happened when a truck carrying bricks, look at that, lost control right in the middle of traffic. Oof. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here's a look at what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Bangladesh, a huge fire at a mall, killing at least 46 people. The health minister there says dozens of others are hurt, some pretty seriously. 
You can see some folks had to be rescued with cranes. Fire officials say a gas leak or a stove from a restaurant in the building is probably what set off this fire. Out of Mexico, more than 21 million people are facing a terrible water shortage in Mexico City, the biggest city by population in North America. Officials say reservoirs hit historic lows this week. Look at that. They point to the city's growth and a long-standing drought as part of the problem. Local officials are actually having to ration water in some spots. With folks using water tanker trucks for now, they say it's just not enough. And out of Peru, a truck loaded with bricks, losing control, look at that, hurting five elderly people outside of Lima. You saw that security camera video. It crashes into another car, then it goes, that's the opposite direction of traffic, spewing bricks out the back the whole way, sending up that big puff of dust, basically. The driver apparently told officials that there was some kind of a mechanical problem, a mechanical failure that caused him to lose control. Back here at home now, it's just a few days to go before the biggest primary night of the election year so far, and quite possibly Nikki Haley's last stand. Voters in the 15 states you see here in yellow, they're going to head to the polls on Super Tuesday. With Haley still in the race, even though she hasn't won a single Republican primary contest so far, but she has just gotten her first Senate endorsement from Alaska Republican Lisa Murkowski. Alaska is one of the states that votes on Tuesday, one of the ones in the yellow that you just saw. Our Kristen Welker sitting down with Haley today for an exclusive one-on-one -on -one ahead of Sunday's Meet the Press. With Haley delivering a pretty serious warning about what she thinks of a second Trump term. Listen. Do you think Donald Trump would follow the Constitution if he were elected to a second term? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, you always want to think someone will. But I don't know. You know, when you when you go in and you talk about revenge, when you go and you talk about, you know, vindication, when you go and you talk about what does that mean? Like, I don't know what that means. And only he can answer for that. What I can answer for is I don't think there should ever be a president that's above the law. I don't think that there should ever be a president that has total immunity to do whatever they want to do. I think that we need to have someone that our kids can look up to that they can be proud of. And I think we need to have a country of law and order, a country of freedom, and a country that goes back to respecting the value of a taxpayer dollar. And we don't have any of that right now. Fresh off that interview is our very own Krista Welker, moderator of Meet the Press, who is joining us now. Okay, so here's Haley, right? Right. She is trying to make her closing argument, trying to sharpen her case against former President Trump ahead of Super Tuesday, a big deal night for her. Maybe the last time we mm -hmm. see her in this race, right? Talk us through some of your takeaways from this discussion and what you make of what she told you. Well, it, it was a stunning moment because she sort of paused and thought about it and then gave that very That's serious always warning. thinking about things. It, always, it was, you know, it was yeah. a tell that this was, this was a serious, and frankly, a candid moment, and I think to your point, Hallie, she has been sharpening what she has been saying. She seems undeterred by the fact that she hasn't won any states. I mean, it, it seems like, and I pressed her on this repeatedly, are you just in this to make the case against Trump, to make the case for your vision of the Republican Party? She didn't deny that this was in some ways a fight for the Republican Party, but she also says she's not anti-Trump. What was notable, obviously his legal battles are looming over all of this. In the primary, you and I have discussed this Just endlessly. Just talked about it on the show. Yes, like, it know, has right, only right. emboldened him. But if he does win the nomination, if he is in a general election, it could be a very different story. So I asked her if she wants to see all of his cases go to trial before Election Day in November. Here's how she answered. I think all of the cases should be dealt with before November. We need to know what's going to happen before it ha before the presidency happens, because after that, should he become president, I don't think any of it's going to get heard. I don't think that a president should be immune from anything. I think that the president has to live under laws, too. And he's asking for things that no other president's ever asked for. So I hope the Supreme Court rules quickly, um, and I hope they make their decision. But I think that they do have to make an, give an answer on this. So that was notable also, basically saying these cases need to yeah. go to trial before election day. That, by the way, Hallie was at an event on the campaign trail, if you will, a little close to where close we are to right home now, it's in the trail. Falls Church. Listen, man, 30 minutes away from the bureau, yeah. that still counts. Exactly. You know, what's interesting to me, she's, she's been getting sort of more and more intense about her warnings yes. about what a, yes. what a Donald Trump term would mean, a second mm -hmm. term for former President Trump in the White House. Would she still back him if he were nominated? So, okay, a little tease for what you're going to see on Sunday. I asked her that a number of times. 
You'll have to tune in on Sunday to see if she gives me a definitive answer. But that's really the question, right? Is she going to back him after all of this? I can tell you, I've been talking to a number of Republicans who have said, yes, she has to because she has a political future. I ask her about how she mm. sees her political future as well. And political future on the national stage. There's right, speculation, does right. she try again in 2028 if she doesn't get it exactly. this time? Exactly. But right. Hallie, the question is, I go back to your point, which is that her attacks have gotten sharper by the day. How does she win back the Trump voters if she were to run in 2028? It becomes very complicated. We talk about that. We talk third about third party stuff. We right? talk about third party right. stuff. Yeah. We also talk about IVF and a little foreign policy. I mean, what a potpourri it's a, it's uh, of a fascinating potpourri. topics. We're definitely going to be tuning in Sunday morning. I will see you Great 100% on Sunday. You, Crystal Walker. Thank you, sir. Appreciate Thank you. you. For uh, more, me. of course, on Sunday on Meet the Press. And then more from Ms. Welker, myself, our friend Tom Yamas, Lester Holt, Savannah Guthrie. On Tuesday, big time Super Tuesday coverage, seven hours of it at least. Get ready, starting at 5 o'clock Eastern, however you're watching now, and on NBC News. Coming up, the push to end legacy admissions at private schools. Why people think changes in one state could mean a nationwide movement. That's our original tonight. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight, it's the battle over college admissions. Because right now in Connecticut, lawmakers are looking to end legacy admissions. Like, you know, if you get into a school because a relative went there. They want to end it not just for state schools, but for private schools, too. They say it's a question of fairness. But schools like Yale, of course, in Connecticut, say it's not fair. Here's Rahim Ellis. <laughs> A potential first out of Connecticut, the state trying to end one of the most controversial practices in higher education, legacy admissions. That's when a college gives preference to an alum's child, grandchild, sibling, any relative over another candidate. Colorado banned the practice for public schools back in 2021. States like California, New York, Maryland, Virginia, and Massachusetts are thinking about their own bans. Congress is too. This comes after the Supreme Court's conservative majority blocked race-based admissions in landmark rulings against Harvard and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Now Connecticut wants to take it a step further, pushing to end legacy admissions at private schools too. This is really an issue you know, of fairness, and I think it's especially important after the Supreme Court decision last year we asked Democratic State Senator Derek Slapp, who runs Connecticut's state's education committee, why he thinks schools like Yale should be subject to state law. He says it's because of taxes. Let's take Yale, where they would pay, I saw one report, $90 million more a year in property taxes if they weren't uh, granted nonprofit status. As a result, all of us pay more in taxes, right? So the schools can avoid paying taxes. And, um, you know, that's okay. That's we established that they're nonprofits, but that means that they have to operate uh, with the public good in mind. We asked Yale if they would end legacy admissions. They did not respond to our request for comment. So far, only one Connecticut private school, Wesleyan University, has agreed to end legacy admissions. The Connecticut Conference of Independent Colleges, which represents the state's 15 private universities, told our team it opposes the concept of state legislation prohibiting independent colleges in Connecticut from giving preference to legacy students. Adding, banning legacy admissions will not move the needle on promoting equity. But many schools seem to disagree. According to new Department of Education data, especially out west, where some entire states don't have schools that consider legacy. And a huge shift in just four years. Just over a quarter of four-year public and private colleges nationwide consider legacy status, down from half in 2020. But more selective schools are holding tighter to the practice. 57% of them still consider legacy. SLAP says that's a huge issue. So they have an enormous impact on our society, these schools, and it's really a ticket to uh, the elite. And we all have, I think, a stake in making sure that you don't have to be wealthy to go to one of these schools. And that's what the data shows right now. At the most selective schools, 30% of legacy applicants come from the top 1%, two-thirds from the richest 5%. 
Experts like James Murphy at Education Reform Now say the backlash nationwide is now bipartisan. Republicans and Democrats both understand how basically unfair legacy preferences are. There's just one catch to this bill. If Yale or any other private school in Connecticut decides not to end legacy admissions, this bill won't penalize them. Murphy says the political pressure is enough. My expectation is that colleges in Connecticut are law-abiding institutions. They want to be on the right side of the law. And once the law is passed, they will drop legacy preferences. Rahima is joining us now. And Rahima, it sounds like the vibe that you're getting from the folks you're talking with is that this is not a Connecticut thing, that this really is headed toward a movement more broadly across the country. Well, Hallie, some people are saying fair is fair. If the mm. Supreme Court says that there cannot be any emissions based on race, then how is it okay to base admissions on legacy, which in many cases benefits wealthy white students? So... Money is also something they think is going to be persuasive. In fact, in California this week, a couple of assemblymen are reintroducing a bill that would say to private universities that they, who are getting money from Cal State programming, that if they continue legacy funding, legacy admissions, they might lose some legacy funding, which is, I should say, not legacy funding, but it's public funding. Los Angeles Times newspaper did a spot that said it could be something like $26.6 million dollars they could lose. That might be, pers be persuasive. Rahima Ellis, uh, live for us with all of that. Just an interesting story and one that's going to continue to have dominoes falling, right, in the weeks and the months to come. Rahima, thank you. That's a wrap for this hour. More coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.